Okay, well, uh, it's nice to see you all and uh, welcome to everyone, uh, all the participants uh, to Theory and Practice United, Intercontinental Practices from Face-to-Face -face and Online Spaces. And we have uh, three presenters with us. We have Dr. Steve uh, Prismas, Dr. Osman Solmaz, and Ibrahim Uzkaya. I'm glad to see Ibrahim is here with us. How are you? Thanks for asking. I'm well. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. And uh, to start with our uh, first presenter, uh, Dr. Steve uh, Prismas. Um, it's an honor to uh, introduce him. I'm, I saw his abstract and I looked at his uh, work earlier, uh, but it's especially an honor to uh, be able to introduce him today because he's a fellow Texan. <laughs> uh, so uh, as you all probably know by now, uh, he is affiliated with Texas uh, Christian University. Uh, he's done a, a wide variety of work in the field of linguistic landscape. Uh, he is also a returned Peace Corps volunteer, like me. I was also delighted to see that uh, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, he's a recipient of a Fulbright Distinguished Awards, and uh, he was a faculty supervisor of study abroad programs in Spain, Panama, and Mexico. And it's a real pleasure to see him with us today. And uh, I believe, Dr. Solmaz, all of the participants will have 12 to 15 minutes uh, to speak. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. W would you gentlemen like me to make a creative signal when uh, your time is approaching, or are you keeping track of yourselves? Um, I'm going to try to keep track of myself. Okay. Uh, and Roger. Fantastic. Yes. Okay, so again, it's a real pleasure having all of you here, uh, and I've been looking forward to this panel. Uh, so take it away, uh, Steve. Thank you. Let, let me share my screen here. And as I've been accustomed to doing, I will, um, these past semesters of teaching online, I'll, I'll ask, can you all see my screen? Okay, fantastic. Yes. Um, I wanna share uh, briefly today about a telecollaboration project between pre-service English language teachers at Dicle University in Diyarbakir, Turkey, and my students at um, Texas Christian University, TCU, um, in the U.S. And a telecollaboration is, is, a, is an electronic exchange of ideas and project development uh, between students and I'm focusing in on the title here of bridging because we, we indeed bridged um, language and identities and cultures um, through this idea that um, Dr. Sabo talked about um, throughout his uh, talk as well of translanguaging or the, the use of one's full linguistic repertoire across multiple named languages. Um, and how we accomplish this telecollaboration in what I'm going to uh, say was fairly successful was through the functional approach to communicating electronically or uh, the FACE framework. So why FACE? Uh, as many of you will know, FACE is a linguistic anthropology term uh, by Irvin Goffman in the late 50s. Goffman's research on how people construct their identity in a positive way in a social interaction. Uh, we, we clearly all care about how other people view us. I woke up at four, about 4.30 this morning and um, got out and got my coffee, but got right back home and put a dress shirt on and a jacket and because um, I, I want you all to see me as a professional with positive face. Uh, to lose face then is to uh, look bad in public. If I were to spell something wrong on my screen uh, while teaching a class, my students might laugh at me and I would look bad in public with them and that would be negative face or losing face. To maintain face in a social interaction is to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. You're knowledgeable in a given context. Brown and Levinson 
um, extended this idea of face to talk about politeness. And this idea of saving face is not only protecting your own positive identity, but also maintaining the positive identity of the person you're talking to. So all of this is really important when teachers decide to connect their students with students on the other side of the world who speak a different language, who have a different culture, we need to be very aware of maintaining face. It might be kind of helpful to think about successful telecollaborations through the lens of well-written about failed collaborations. Um, going back quite a while, uh, Claire Cromsch and Thorne describe a telecollaboration between American students and French students, where at the end, the French student said, those Americans just talked about too much um, chit chat, too much wanting to get to know me, phatic communication, we call this, and didn't talk enough about uh, the project. Uh, Julie Bells in 2002 also described a, a somewhat failed telecollaboration between American students and German students, and it was flip-flopped. This time, the, the Germans reported that the American students didn't spend enough time on phatic communication or trying to get to know each other, sort of this personal communication and wanted to jump right into the referential communication or, or work. Bells also points out that students, when you combine them from different countries, will often bring preconceived ideas of the linguistic proficiencies of their partners. Um, and indeed, in the case of the American and the German telecollaboration, very early on, some of the German students wrote um, messages like, well, our English is probably better than your German, so why don't we just do all of this in English? And they, they probably were right, but it took face away from the American students who felt really bad about the project and, and didn't practice much of their German. So to have a successful, and I hope our project with uh, TCU students and Dietschle students was successful, I think we need to think a lot about this right amount of phatic or small talk with referential business communication. One way to kind of show that is to show actual communication between our two universities. And, and this is an email sent to me by Dr. Solmas. And you can see he starts off in Spanish, a language that we both share, and in Turkish, uh, a language that I'm an emergent speaker of. And then he continues on in Turkish uh, to talk about phatic communication. And in doing that, he's making a very purposeful um, point of saving my face as an emergent Turkish speaker. And then he goes into mostly English for what we would call the referential part of, or the business part of the communication, um, which is also showing how good he is at English. And he's fantastic at English. Uh, so that's maintaining positive face as well. And then he finishes with this translanguaging of Spanish, a shared language, and Turkish again to, to say, yes, Steve, I know you understand Turkish, um, so we can write that way too. This is a very informative email because what it shows us is this phatic referential sandwich where we use both phatic information and language and referential um, business-like speech. So this does a great job of explaining what the face framework or the functional approach to communicating electronically is. Before we started our telecollaboration, Dr. Solmas at Dichle University and, and I instructed our students about the functional approach to communicating electronically or the face framework. And we said, have a combination of phatic language and referential language. And one way you might do that is to write phatic communication in one language, perhaps the target language or your first language, and referential language 
in the other, the target or your first language. And here's an example of my email response back to Osman, where I start off in, would actually be my L3 or L4 Turkish with Fatik, just saying, hello, how are you? Thanks for your email. Merhaba dostum, malin için teşekkür ederim. And then go to my first language for referential speak, or language here in English, and end the email back in Turkish with Fatik. Take care of yourself, see you later. And in this way, we share languages, but also have a good mix of both small talk, Fatik communication to get to know each other, and referential communication to get the job done. So to kind of give you an idea of what our television was, we had a truncated or short amount of time to connect our students. Um, my semester here in Texas started in August and Osman students at Dichle University started early in October. My semester ended um, mid-November. So we had like about five weeks to connect our students. So we both introduced the project to our students around October 15th. We had four weeks of sustained interaction via the Canvas platform and discussion board. And we had 21 teams of partners. So this included 20 TCU students here in Texas, 20 Dichle students in Diyarbakir um, teaming up, plus Dr. Solm created a team as well. Across the four weeks, we had a total of 121 discussion board exchanges on the Canvas platform, which was roughly an average of around six exchanges per team, about uh, maybe one a week, a little bit more than one a week. The Dichle students communicated more. They produced 67 uh, discussion board posts or 55% of the communication compared to 54 discussion board posts by TCU students. So what was it that we asked them to do? Well, we asked them to create a bridging activity framework project or lesson. And I know throughout this digital symposium, you're probably all familiar with what bridging activity frameworks are. Here's an example. This lesson was created by a Turkish student, a student at Dijle University, who created the first two stages of the lesson and sent the lesson to Texas to have the TCU student complete the lesson with the third stage and the fourth stage. And then the TCU student created his or her own lesson, the first two stages, sent it to Dichle University and had the Dichle student complete the third and the fourth stage. So not only did we share language, but we also, also shared culture and uh, lesson planning, so to speak. This was a really interesting lesson about religious signs. And you can see this is stage one with asking participants to think about these signs and the language on there. Stage two, what might some of these messages mean? And this was completed by the Turkish student. And then the TCU student completed stage three by finding another sign in the linguistic landscape and saying, maybe replace having students replace this message with another message that might attract people to this church. And then stage four, asking students to cre create their own signs that would attract people to gather. We're just getting into some of the preliminary results and I mostly just have information from my students to look at, but some of the themes that are coming out are my students saw this as a very successful partnership. They found the Dichle students to be very nice and friendly and they wanted to be friends with them. They also recognized that the Dichle students had the burden of communication, not only in communicating more, but more in the target language of English because my students didn't know Turkish. Um, but my students, although not Turkish language teachers, or even learning Turkish, 
commented that they learned a lot of Turkish, which made them feel good, but also realizing their monolingualism, or at least not knowing Turkish, made them feel incompetent and bad. The FACE framework encouraged a lot of language play. Dichle students used French, Spanish, Italian, when they found out that the TCU students also knew some of those languages. And then there was this very great awareness of how much, when, and why Turkish and English were used and what the messages created were based on those language choices. Uh, just to highlight a couple voices, one TCU student was grateful for this possibility. They said if they could do it again, they would spend more time creating relationships and less time on the assignments, which is telling. And it made them feel incompetent to not know another language. Another TCU student said that this collaboration with individuals from Dichele was unlike anything they'd ever done in the past. That they feel like the lesson they created together was a fully cohesive lesson and it would be successful. And that they now have a much stronger interest in learning Turkish and getting to know the culture of Turkey as well, which is a great um, objective of telecollaboration projects. And to the next steps, I want to continue with Dr. Solmas analyzing exchanges and perspectives from not only TCU students, but Dichle students as well. Uh, this is one comment from a Dichle student that I was able to, to see. I really enjoyed the process. I found my partner was kind and helpful and we didn't have a problem communicating with each other. So some, some uh, similarities in comments. And I want to elaborate with more evidence for each theme. Um, if this is a bridge, I believe is in Diabriker and the theme from all of this symposium is bridging uh, with bridging activities framework. And I will look for questions and uh, at the end and let Dr. Solmas take over now. Thank you, Steve, uh, Roger. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Steve. That was really wonderful. And uh, it is, I, I appreciated seeing the results of your project and your uh, sharing of them, uh, because that really emphasized the whole point about why the Regional English Language Office in Turkey uh, provided support for the project in the first place to promote mutual understanding uh, An intercultural communication. Uh, so that was really fantastic to see. Thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to seeing questions at the end of the panel. Uh, our next presenter uh, is, uh, I hope, someone who is familiar to everyone by now, uh, but I, I'll give him an official introduction nonetheless. Uh, Dr. Osman Solmaz and his uh, presentation is Raising Elf Awareness through linguistic landscapes, geo-based fieldwork, experiences of teacher candidates. Uh, he is the director of the Linguistic Landscape in ELT project. Uh, he conducted part of his master's thesis research at SUNY Albany uh, and through another outstanding embassy program, the Fulbright program, uh, received his PhD in second language acquisition and teaching from the University of Arizona. Um, uh, he uh, is assistant professor of English language teaching at Dijla University, and he also serves as the vice dean in the faculty of education there. Uh, and it's an aunt, you can hear my daughter in the background, uh, that, that happens at least once, uh, once a day. Uh, and it's a real pleasure uh, to be with him today and hear from him. And uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Solmaz. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'm trying to share my document. Um, can you see it? Uh, 
Okay, I believe you can see the screen, right? All right. So um, when we started this project, we wondered as the team of the project, we were wondering what we should do about ourselves because we were trying to bring linguistic landscapes into English language teaching classrooms. But what were we going to do for ourselves and our teaching? So we wanted to take advantage of this uh, project and implement LL-based activities into our individual courses as well. So this presentation that I'm going to make today will be about a, a practice rather than a research because it's an initial step. Uh, we are still in the initial part of the process. So therefore, I would like to see it as an activity that could be implemented at university level classrooms. So my topic is raising ELF awareness through linguistic landscapes, geo-based fieldwork experiences of teacher candidates. So a little bit of background on linguistic landscapes and I won't keep it too long because we have had a really wonderful day and people talking about different aspects of linguistic landscapes. So it's basically the language surrounding us in forms of words, images, murals, or graffitis in public and or private spaces. And as we heard from other presenters and keynote talks, it's much more than the language that we see because it involves symbolic meaning uh, as well. But when we look at the research, we see that it's typically theoretically oriented and we see a little uh, coverage of pedagogical practices or implementation of pedagogical practices of linguistic landscapes is rather limited. Therefore, we think about bringing it to uh, pedagogical context because simply they are everywhere and they generally reflect sociocultural and linguistic diversity of a community and they exemplify symbols and signs featuring language play because of the multilingual language use as well. And then they provide everyday examples of the presence of English language in English and non-English settings. This is for EFL classrooms, but we also see different examples of other languages. So the other aspect of this talk is about ELF and World Englishes or ELF. Uh, so the presence of world Englishes or global Englishes uh, are increasing and the research on world Englishes, typically also referred as global Englishes, has received an increasing attention over the years, especially the last couple of decades. And it's emerging as a separate yet intertwined thread of research in modern English language and sociolinguistic studies. The concept of world English uh, provides fresh perspectives for English teachers and learners to view the language from a critical and multilingual perspective. Uh, because when we look at the English language teaching, it's typically considered as a field which is dominated by the monolithic view of English by Matsuda. And the nature of world English is, on the other hand, is pluralistic. So it raises implications for English language teaching as well. And we, we see that there are many uh, examples emerging for World English's informed EFL pedagogies, such as Global English's language teaching, uh, particularly by the uh, through the works of Galloway, Nicholas Galloway. And then we have Alphaware ELT education, as we have heard from our keynote speaker, Dr. Bayurt, and we have World Englishes Informed ELT by Matsuda. So the, all of these concepts prioritize the importance of illustrating difference, uh, presence of diverse Englishes, their speakers, uh, speakers and relevant resources in ELT classroom context. So multiple English forms over standard forms uh, and fluid cultures instead of fixed native English cultures are preferred especially according to these uh, concepts. And all English users are often regarded as the owner of English uh, rather than just native English speakers, so to speak. 
Let's have a look at the pedagogical context and participants. Uh, in Turkey, as part of a curriculum change in teacher education, which was also recommended in earlier studies uh, by Incechay and Akke, Turkish Higher Education Council implemented a change in ELT programs and included the addition of the an elective course titled World Englishes and Culture. So the goal is to make sure that teacher candidates develop familiarity with the terms such as English as a lingua franca, English as an in, uh, international language, world Englishes, uh, so that they can understand the relationship between English as a lingua franca and teaching English and gain a better perspective on the connection between cultures and language and its place in teaching and familiarizing themselves with the concept and practices of world English as language teaching or alphabet pedagogy. So for this study, uh, which is ongoing, it's cross-sectional study. That means I have implemented this in 2019 uh, in the fall semester with 27 students. And right now I'm, all, I, I'm currently teaching 36 students, which forms the second cohort. And the first, uh, for this class, students were required to, uh, were, requi were introduced to global status of English, as well as the terms such as lingua franca, English as an international language, world global Englishes, and three co-centric English cycles as well, some of the technical terms as well. And following the historical, cultural, and social context and legacy of English, uh, sociolinguistic discussions such as linguistic imperialism, language attitudes, and native speakerism were also made in this class. The second part of the course focused on the presence and use of world Englishes in English language teaching contexts, along with activities such as textbook, coursebook analysis. And to make sure that we put the local context in sight, the history and status of English in the sociolinguistic context of Turkey is also discussed. And finally, students are given uh, projects to conduct. Uh, in 2019, I asked them to uh, engage in a fieldwork experience. Actually, today, one of the groups of students conducted their presentation. I would like to thank them and congratulate them for being part of this presentation today. So what students are expected, they have, provide, they have been provided a sample of topics and they go outside, take pictures or take notes of linguistic landscape of a particular area. They have been provided alternative topics for digital uh, field work as well, because not all the students uh, should be required to participate or go outside because they may not have this opportunity. And even today in the COVID case, uh, COVID case COVID, during the COVID case, we uh, have this uh, emerging as an important uh, part of this activity as well. Following the data collection, they were provided assistance with the analysis, especially a methodological framework was shared with them to guide them. And then uh, they have submitted mini research paper uh, along with their reflections. Uh, this semester, I asked them to engage in a geotagging activity so there is this application called Linkscape. You can see the icon on the right side of the screen. And through Linkscape, you can take photos and geotag them on the application or online uh, through Linkscape. And I asked students to take 10 pictures in the Arbaker, or given that not all the students live here and we are, in, uh, we are experiencing distance education, they were able to do this project in their own communities as well. And then they were required to write mini reflection and fieldwork experience will be repeated this semester as well. But I'm providing uh, students some opportunities for uh, digital practices as well, as some of them uh, are not able to go outside due to the constraints or personal reasons. So we have to keep that in mind too. It's currently in progress and will be completed by the end of this semester. 
So I would like to share uh, these creative topics that linguistic landscape uh, as a result of the emergence of the uh, projects. So we had some students leaning towards digital analysis and some of them engaged in field work. If you look at the topics, you can see that students were really creative. Some of them uh, investigated uh, social media posts in terms of the languages used there. And some of them compared airline websites or uh, when they went outside, they engaged in uh, collecting data in terms of uh, touristic information provided in the historical places or shop naming practices at different parts of city, Diyarbakir in this case, like touristic or non-touristic. Sometimes they compared uh, shop naming practices in two different sections of the city, such as a shopping center in Old Town versus a very modern upscale shopping center. And uh, sometimes uh, they analyzed uh, Englishes adopted at different uh, Turkish universities. So these were more focused on developing awareness of uh, different Englishes, particularly American and British. For the second cohort, you can see an example. This is the map that I have taken a, a screenshot from Linkscape. You can visit the website and see it. In the uh, previous uh, section, it was just Istanbul and really tiny dots in other uh, cities. Uh, but now you can see a lot of points with pictures. When you visit them, you can see the photos uploaded by my students. And when we go deeper into this section, most of our students live in the region, in the southeastern region. Therefore, we see that there are many photos are uploaded, particularly in southeastern Anatolia region. And you can see that they have uploaded 437 photos in this region only. And let's get deeper here and see and look at Diyarbakir, you can see there are 358 photos that are uploaded by myself and students. Uh, and all the photos that are uploaded are categorized by the languages, as you can see, an example, uh, Morgan Coffee House. And we see that English and German are uh, listed as languages. And then a small comment is added by the students so uh, it's true this this activity that we believe uh, students will devel uh, develop their alpha awareness so preliminary findings uh, indeed i have observed that they uh, developed alpha awareness but it's uh, it needs to be confirmed by further data and further analysis of the data so many of them were surprised to see the presence of english and it helped them be aware of them more and more. Actually, some of the students pointed that they will, uh, they will look more carefully next time. And some of the students noted that they regained alpha awareness because they said that they used to see them before, but typically they ignored them. And then we see that uh, they have developed a sociolinguistic awareness as well. Uh, because they criticized, some of them criticized the use of English, uh, but no priority given to local languages uh, in a particular area. So they, when they have taken images, they had time to think and reflect more about the role and status of languages uh, spoken in that particular area. And then finally, I realized that they interpreted the functions of English, like English as the prestige language or English being commonly used in the touristic area. So based on the audience and then using English in different and creative ways, such as hybrid, uh, hybrid side English science. And then why English used like such as uh, use of English for communicative purposes. When we look at the implications, I see that World English and Culture course 
could be incorporated into the main coursework in EFL teacher education curriculum. It's a good step that we have it as elective course, but I have heard and read from many of my students that it should be incorporated as a main course. And then we realized that even it's a single semester course, it can make a difference in terms of alpha awareness, which can facilitate their future adoption of alpha-aware English language teaching pedagogies. And linguistic landscape center tasks have the potential to create not only English as a lingua franca, but also sociolinguistic awareness among teacher candidates. For conclusion, the incorporation of awareness raising courses and activities such as this one can help teacher candidates to develop critical and reflective questioning skills as also noted in the literature and confront their own preconceived information and knowledge about the English language. And also developing and possessing a more pluralistic view of ELT is important for practitioners as they would engage their learners in alpha aware practices by raising their world English awareness. And finally, I would like to mention about my own particular future direction for this project. Following linguistic landscape based activities and tasks, we can guide our students for the design and implementation of linguistic landscape resources into language classes. Well, that's it for my presentation. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to ask uh, after the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Solmaz. And we actually have uh, a few good questions uh, in the Q&A right now. Uh, so how about we uh, have the third presentation uh, with Mr. Uzkaya? and then uh, we can address the questions at the end. I think there will be time for that. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to welcome Mr. Ibrahim uh, Uzkaya. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, his uh, talk is entitled Live Streaming the Linguistic Landscapes, the Use of Linguistic Landscapes in Online Education. Uh, he is a teacher of English at a state school in Ergani Diyarbakir. And he originally studied at the cinema and television department at Anadolu University uh, before changing uh, to the English language teaching department at uh, Dijla University. And uh, it's noted that he graduated from the program in a record three years while maintaining the highest GPA among the graduates in his year. So congratulations, Mr. Uzkaya. Well, at and uh, he uh, contributes to this project through some of his skills, including photography and video creation. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome him. And uh, I will give him the floor. This uh, looks to be a very interesting presentation. Please take it away, Mr. Uzkaya. Well, thank you for this wonderful introduction, Mr. Karam. I'm so honored. Thank you. So. Let me share my screen. So, it's a cliche, but I have to ask, do you see it like full screen right now? Okay then. So what I'm going to talk about is actually a teaching practice uh, method. Uh, let me start straight away, like, let me first share uh, the content of my PowerPoint presentation. So first I will talk about uh, the idea of live, live streaming the linguistic landscapes. And then we will talk about how we, uh, when I say we, I mean uh, me and my co-workers for this project, uh, how we carried out uh, this idea and why live streaming? What are the advantages and disadvantages? And while we are talking about them, uh, I also prepared a short video, one minute, like I took some short uh, brief footage from uh, three different sessions. So I combined them. Uh, I also wanted to share the video. 
And I will also talk about the outcome, the participants' opinions. We conducted an, a survey, an online survey, and maybe we had some problems. If we had, I will also talk about them and maybe some ideas to improve it. So the idea, what is the idea? So this is, a, this is an innovative way to engage linguistic landscapes in online education. So um, do you have any idea about visual reality? I'm asking the audience, if you have any ideas, you can just maybe share it with me like through the chat. By the way, I cannot see the chat part, so I'm going to any comments. We have using visual Google Maps reality passes from Sirkan Pala, and then the uh, Kardalin Aslan mentions the visual elements we can see in our daily lives. Okay, so have you seen these? Um, visual reality glasses. Like, okay, so not that, but the thing we, yeah, now I can see the guy here. So let me just share my PowerPoint again. Okay, so the idea is about engaging uh, second language learners with uh, the target language country's culture, actually. In which case, we are going to talk about the United States. So we have a, a speaking instructor living in the United States in North Carolina. And we have six participants uh, who wants to learn English uh, at, the, at the level of elementary, and they apply to uh, take online classes with us, and we start our session. So they connect to their speaking instructor in the United States, while the speaking instructor is not sitting at home, but outside, holding his camera, mobile phone, walking around, sitting in a cafe, uh, shopping in a mall or a supermarket and showing around and uh, like exposing them to the linguistic landscape materials and directly exposing them to the culture and having a nice authentic uh, conversation with them. So we actually have two instructors. So like uh, this is not the uh, only instructors they have, like they have a main also uh, language instructor, uh, which is living in Turkey. So they are having six weekly hours of English classes plus 19 minutes weekly session of live streaming the linguistic landscape session. So where, well, practically almost everywhere, like in the, uh, in the street, uh, in a shopping mall, in a coffee house, uh, in a supermarket, so uh, she's using a cell phone, a smartphone mainly, but uh, a tablet also is possible. Laptop, not advice, like, uh, because sometimes you have to walk around, so it's going to be problematic for you. So the advantages, I believe some of you are familiar with uh, social, new social media tools, right? We have Twitch, like, people play uh, online games or uh, video games. And while they are playing, some people are watching them playing and, and, and they even donate some money there to them. Like, uh, and also we have some, uh, like live streaming uh, has become a very big thing. Like the whole world is watching people live streaming through Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube, like Twitch. So, as I understand, it's a, it's a big motivation for them, like watching uh, things like live, uh, it, it keeps them focused on the screen and like they're observing 
with an enthusiasm, like they really wonder what's going on there. So uh, it gives them like something more than motivation. And they're also given the chance to uh, direct the instructor. Like it's not just the instructor who is just showing around and uh, teaching, but whenever they see something, whenever they want to ask something about what they see, like it could be a mural, like a, like a, a price tag, maybe uh, anything, like they can ask questions, they can like direct her or him to uh, maybe zoom in a bit, like, and have a talk about it. So we, we can say this uh, in here in this idea, instructor acts like a tool guide, like, but uh, you cannot uh, guide a tour guide, you know, if you are visiting a country, but here you can guide your instructor. Um, so absolutely, our, our main purpose was to increase the culture awareness. Like you are, you are trying to learn a language, uh, like which is like mainly spoken in the United States and you have no idea about American culture. So uh when you when first like once you start to learn about american culture language is not grammar for you anymore like it's not a class it's not a course uh you 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 get the uh idea that language has something to do with culture so if i get to learn about the culture uh learning language practicing language would be more easier for me so I'm going to show you some footage here now. Uh, I hope I open the sound. Yep, I think I'm having a problem with opening it. Or maybe is it taking too much time because it's because of internet connection, maybe. So anyway, I will just talk about it. So here you see a, a linguistic landscape material. So uh, actually, this is not a picture. So the instructor is holding the camera, like uh, she's using the rear facing camera. Uh, of course, sometimes she's using uh, the selfie camera to talk face to face. So this is the clothing shop, like uh, she's walking around and actually she's shopping there, by the way. And the participants are being exposed to the language and they are asking questions they get to learn about the tax. Like they were very surprised once they heard that like the price tag changes when you once you go to the cashier. Like they 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 add the tax when you go to the cashier. Like in Turkey we don't have that. You see the uh, price tag uh, tax added. Uh, okay then. So disadvantages. Yeah, it's cold. Absolutely. Um, by the way, she is the instructor. She is a student in the United States. Her name is Ishilai, living in North Carolina. She's helping me with this uh, idea. Like, and I felt very sorry for her and, and I apologized to her. Like she, it was very cold outside, it's winter. So, and another disadvantage, yeah, it's in winters, maybe yeah, it, it may not work like as well as in summer. Like in winter, maybe you have to uh, just go to the, your indoor places. Uh, and also it's too much work uh, for the instructors because you have to drive uh, to the place where you're supposed to lecture. And also you are holding your cell phone or tablet the whole time, like 90 minutes. And this is also a disadvantage. And also uh, the instructor can, all, can just uh, teach verbally, like you cannot show something like writing on a board or something. So uh, the participants are supposed to take notes just from what they hear. Uh, this could be another uh, disadvantage. 
Well, the outcome, I, as I said before, I conducted an online survey. Uh, I, I asked 18 participants from different levels, by the way, elementary, pre-intermediate, and starter. Uh, and I asked them how they thought about it. And the, the mainly, they, they, they said that normally we couldn't speak English. Like, we had an anxiety that, like, how to start a sentence, but now it's gone. Like because it, it doesn't feel like a uh, class, like we are just chit-chatting and most of the time we don't even see the instructor, just somebody is walking around and we see things and there's a uh, narrative like sound, a narrator speaking behind and we are just talking to the net narrator. And another improvement is being able to ask questions. Normally we, um, teachers are supposed to ask the questions and participants and students are supposed to answer. But here, since they are being exposed to many different things, they are very intrigued to ask many questions as possible. Like, what's that? What, what, what's this? Like, why are they using this? How are they doing that? Like, so they have a very big interest in American culture. And also since uh, every class takes place within a context, uh, participants get the idea of like guessing a word is not a bad idea. Like they can assign meanings to the words, to the new words, you know, in context, even if they know the meaning of it. Uh, we talked about cultural awareness. Yes, absolutely. So their food, their cuisine, like how they are, uh, how are they, how are their like coffee houses, coffee shops, like how often they go to there, like, like how, what, what time do they wake up like uh, and sleep because, because of the time difference, you know, uh, you know, here they attend at like 9 p.m. and there it's like in the morning. So they also have a chance to talk about the uh, American people, like usual uh, sleeping and going out times. And absolutely, it was fun. Yeah, this was uh, their opinion. Like, it was fun, absolutely fun. Like, uh, it, it's something new. And we didn't see something like that before. Uh, like, we, we, we even forget that we are actually taking a course of English. Like, we're just having fun, learning something new. Uh, and. The problem, COVID-19, absolutely. Uh, during pandemic, it was very difficult to uh, conduct some of our sessions because you are not uh, supposed to go out. Actually, even though it's not forbidden, it's dangerous for the instructor, you know, to specifically to go indoor places. So uh, that's why I asked the Shalai to usually to be like, uh, outside where she can keep her like social distancing. For improving this idea, I thought maybe, you know, an instructor from America, another one from England, another one from other English spoken country, maybe, maybe it could be a good idea. So you can also get to learn about different cultures where English is the main language and different cities. I'm also planning uh, on this one. Maybe I, I have some friends living in, in New York, Boston, and California. So maybe uh, we can do that. Co-teaching, yes. Uh, maybe two instructors at the same time, like 90 minutes. Uh, however, participants think it's a short time. Like uh, they can't get enough of it, but uh, it's very long time for the instructor to, you know, carry the mobile phone like all around and walking. So maybe co-teaching co -teaching would be like more easy. And reverse teaching, maybe since uh, the instructor living in America, by the way, she could be an American person, Mexican or a native speaker, like uh, it doesn't matter. What's important is like she, she's, she's aware of the American culture, like she's, uh, she has a bit of information uh, about American culture. So reverse teaching is the idea of participants, one of the participants every week, going out and teaching to the others, like 
to the, even the instructors to, uh, about their culture, like from their country, like going out, going into a cafe, supermarket, and do what the instructor does, like generally. Well, that was all. Uh, thank you for listening to me. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm ready to Thank answer. you so much. That was fantastic. I enjoyed hearing that. And I think we have uh, a few minutes for questions for a few uh, queries. I think they're in the Q&A section from uh, Gulsamin uh, Joshkun. It looks like uh, that question is for the first presentation. Did any of the students have a difficulty in this project? Uh, what was her or his problem? And I think uh, Steve addressed some of those uh, concerns, but do you have any other comment uh, on areas that maybe students had difficulty? Thank you for the question. It's a good one. I, I'll say briefly that the difficulties that you might think that would happen connecting two different students and universities or students from two different universities like technology, didn't really happen. We, we had um, good platform, um, good access. Um, we, even, we even met together in a Zoom one time after the project ended and everything went really well. What I would say is that time, um, my students were ending their semester. They were getting ready to take their final exams and I was asking them to do this new project, um, whereas I think uh, Dijle students may have had uh, more time because of the semester, and all students would have liked to have done this longer, I think. And the last thing I will say is that there are ideological barriers that need to come down in language teaching when we connect different cultures. One of them is this idea that you have to communicate in the target all the time when you're learning that language. And, and I think what we learned from using the FACE framework is that purposeful translanguaging can facilitate positive identity and positive language development. When you share languages, when you allow yourself the grace and the freedom to share your language and share the, your partner's language, a lot of walls come down and a lot of great learning happens. So um, I think just making those uh, messages clear at the beginning, um, you avoid a lot of problems. Thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you. And it looks like we have uh, one question for Dr. Solmaz from uh, Dr. Bayor. Do you have a course on sociolinguistics at the undergraduate level at your university before introducing a concept like world Englishes to your trainee teachers. And she continues to say, what do you think about presenting a topic like world Englishes and culture before presenting a course on the history of English and or sociolinguistics to your students? What is your opinion, Dr. Solmaz? Well, thank you for the questions, Dr. Bayert. And I would like to uh, actually combine all the questions, all of these questions. Uh, first of all, unfortunately, we did not have any sociolinguistics course at undergraduate level until this semester, and it's also offered as elective, uh, but students do not take all these two courses at the same time. Therefore, it's kind of challenging. I wish they had seen this before World English's course. That would be definitely more useful. And I think that it's dangerous to present a course uh, on world Englishes and cultures before students are familiar with the topics like history of English, uh, varieties of English and sociolinguistics, or at least some, some of the sociolinguistic background. Therefore, when I created my syllabus for this uh, course, this particular course, I went through uh, particular examples, uh, including yours, uh, uh, yours and Spaki's, and then uh, we have Galloway. Some of the curriculum, I went through them and I realized that 
first we have to give them brief information or at least we have to cover historical, social and cultural context of English. That's why I have divided my course when I designed it into two parts. In the first part uh, of the semester, I introduced them the concepts such as English as a lingua franca, English as an international language, uh, world Englishes, global Englishes. And then we go ahead and talk about historical, social and cultural context of English. And then we talk about varieties of English, which is also related to another question that I see in the chat box. Uh, different types of varieties of English, accents, dialects. We are presenting that, especially in colonial countries as well. Because as I mentioned during the presentation, we talk about three concentric circles of Kashru, uh, which uh, touches on this topic. Uh, and later in the second part of the course, typically after midterm exams, I introduce World English's language teaching and then talk about how we can develop lessons based on uh, alphabet pedagogy or World English's informed pedagogy. Thank you so much for answering uh, the other question that came in, Dr. Solmaz. And it looks like we have one more question uh, again for you, Dr. Solmaz, and also for uh, Dr. Uh, Prismas. And uh, the person asks, you chose a very provocative uh, topic for collecting data, religion. And I was uh, wondering about this as well. How would it be different if you chose a different theme for the study? Great question. I'll jump in, Osman, if that's okay. Um, out, of, out of the 21 partners, um, they all had their own choice of topic of, of linguistic landscapes. And there was just one team, uh, actually just one participant of one team uh, that chose religious signs. Um, I agree that was very provocative and it produced a lot of conversation in class when we talked about that one. Uh, but the other... 39 um, topics were ranged from lesson planning to wearing masks, um, signs on businesses about mask requirements, school lunches, what school buses look like in different countries, clothing, um, cafes, restaurants. So it was a wide amalgam of themes that all really produced and that's what's great about linguistic landscapes. They produced um, a comprehensive sample of the world we live in and the signs that surround us. Thank you so much. Uh, I was just handed a cookie by my daughter there. So. Ooh, I want one. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> I don't see any other questions. So uh, Dr. Somaz, would you like to move uh, to concluding remarks? Mm-hmm. Yes, nope. uh, let me, uh, if I can share screen. So uh, this is the end of a very, very productive day. And I would like to thank every one of you participating in this, uh, in, the, in these events throughout the day. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. David Malinowski, Dr. Yasemin Bayur, and Thomas Peter Zabo for joining us and uh, agreeing to deliver these wonderful lectures that we have heard throughout the day on uh, linguistic landscapes, world Englishes, alphabet pedagogies, and different uh, types of activities. I would like to also extend my gratitude to DJ University, Texas Christian University, particularly Faculty of Education, uh, the Agricap Faculty of Education, our Dean, uh, Dr. Giray Topal, and Head of uh, Foreign Language Department, uh, Dr. Ninfar Bekleyan, and my colleagues at the department for their support. Uh, we would like to thank US Embassy for funding this project, and uh, we hope that we will continue to do what we can uh, and move beyond this project. And just to briefly uh, remind, we have developed our website, which is accessible at llinealtproject.com. We will upload all the resources there.
us our photos of in-person workshops, which were amazing. I hope that we can do them again when things get back to the normal. And we have uploaded nearly 1,000 images at different categories. You can visit there and use them freely in your uh, classrooms, and they are categorized. And we have also delivered uh, webinars due to the pandemic outbreak, which was really great. We have created uh, resources, uh, uh, bridging activity, informed materials for uh, learners, participants engaged in them, and we will be uploading them to the website very soon as well. As you can see, we have the images, questions, digital resources and ideas for bridging activities in, according to different levels. And I would like to take uh, this opportunity to thank all the teachers who spent a lot of time working on designing their projects and uh, being involved in this program. I know that it's it was somewhat challenging for some of them because it was the first time that they attended a session like that. But when we thought that we uh, wanted to have a closure event for the for this project, we thought that it would be incomplete without the perspectives and practices of English language teachers. So I'm very grateful for each one of them to be involved in this project and presented today. Uh, finally, I would like to share that we are developing a guidebook on linguistic landscapes in pedagogical context. So as soon as we are done, we will be sending out the PDF document of the guidebook to everyone who registered for this symposium, and hopefully you will enjoy them. Uh, and we have an announcement before we close and finish. Uh, there is this sister project called Local Linguistic Landscapes, localproject.eu. They have an online training week I briefly mentioned uh, today, early today. So they offer a training week which English language teachers or other uh, teachers can join. If you are interested, just click and see. Uh, finally, thank you everyone for everything and thank you, Roger, for being with us today. My pleasure. And uh, any other concluding remarks from our panelists? I too just I want to thank you, Roger, for for your support throughout this project. Um, I have as a researcher and an individual, and my students have as well, as a result of this. Project, and I'm very thankful for for all of your support, uh, Ibrahim Osman. As always, fantastic. I've appreciated your collaboration throughout this year and a half as well. Well, I, will, I would also like to thank you, first of all, to U.S. Embassy for your support to our project, and Dr. Rospons Olmos for offering me this job, this wonderful job, and helping me out, showing, showing me the way throughout the procedure, and also Dr. Prismas for hosting us in, in Fort Worth, Texas. Like, it was a wonderful uh, experience to be with you there. Uh, thank you to the, all the participants for being there, watching us. Uh, thank you a lot. Thank you, and Dr. Solmaz will we'll give you the last word. Well, I'm, I am very happy today. It was, uh, it was really tiring, I mean, organizing and bringing together all these wonderful people, but it's definitely worth it, and uh, we enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to be in touch with everyone who is interested in this topic and definitely uh, with the embassy for further collaboration. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a